All right. Hey, Emma. Hello. How's it all going? It is cold and wintry without snow. It's not fair. Yeah, that's not fair. We had like one day of mediocre snow and the kids just really wanted to go sledding and they were disappointed and cold and wet and it just didn't work out. So, uh, yeah, no, we had like minus, like I said, we had like minus 12 but with no snow and then we had like just barely freezing with really terrible snow. So, no. And in fact, our mountain is hasn't even opened this year. We've had like oh, no wow. rain. Yeah. Last year we had the most snow of any mountain, I think, in North America, maybe even in the world. Like we'll get seven meters of snow. Damn. Yeah, in on our mountain, and this year, twenty five centimeters. It's nothing. They're they're pretty sure they'll they'll have to not open the mountain this year. So. Yeah, we're we're speaking Celsius minus five ish right now, and there is no snow, and it's just like if you're gonna stay below zero, dang it, have snow on the ground at least. Yeah, and was uh, was Christmas madness? Uh, um, you don't have kids, so it's you know no. it's only a set amount. You just all of your strays that you bring in every year, right? <laughs> I I had random people over. Um, we we played uh, cards against humanity to the point of questioning our our morality. <laughs> Dad, don't stare into that abyss. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but it was a good day, <laughs> and uh, we we overfilled the refrigerator and took advantage of the cool temperatures to use the patio as part of the refrigerator. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, okay, so uh, for people who have no idea what they are seeing, uh, it's Fraser and Pamela hanging out, talking. Enjoy. This is the show. No, uh, no we're going to record a live episode <laughs> of Astronomy Cast. So if you're familiar with Astronomy Cast and you only hear the audio portion in your podcast feed, this is all the other stuff that you never get a chance to see and you get to enjoy and experience. So we'll take about 30 minutes to record the show and then we'll stick around and... I offer up Pamela's addled brain for your questioning. And so the way to do that is uh, we, we're using this new service through Google Plus YouTube called uh, the Q&A app. And so if you're watching this video everywhere, if you're watching this over on YouTube, you're watching this on Google Plus, you're watching this embedded on Universe Today, you should see something there that says, watch questions live. And then uh, you can click on that, and then you'll see all the questions and the video. and the two are kind of hand in hand. And so as you pose these questions, you can vote up these questions, and then when the show wraps up, I will uh, start, we'll start to dig through these questions and, and answer your questions. And, and it was, you know, it's working really well. Last week we had, uh, we stuck around for a little too long, actually. We, we, were, we stuck around for another 45 minutes or so after the show, I think, and kept answering questions. It was a questions. Christmas gift. It was good, it was good. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so that's the plan. And, uh, and we'll get recording. Um, oh, you can also, if you want, you can use Twitter. Use the hashtag AstronomyCast. Pamela appears to like Twitter still, so so she may catch it. Um, I do all the social medias. I know, I know, all the social medias. Don't send us any Instagrams. We're not going to catch that. That's true. No. <clears throat> or Snapchats. Um, oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and I will try to watch the uh, event page and the Google+, Plus, but... If no one seems to be talking to you, it's it's because we're just not catching it. So, um, okay, awesome. Well, let's uh, let's get rolling. Um, oops. Okay. Uh, are you are you ready to record? Yeah. Okay, I am also ready to record. Got my intro ready to go. Okay. Say when. I am looking for the record button. I am pressing record, and I'm somehow not in mono. How did I do that? Uh, because GarageBand doesn't default to mono no matter what you no, try to do to make I it happen. No, but swear to God. And you have to switch it every it time because it's terrible. Good old audacity. I'm pressing Never record. Me wrong. You've pressed record? Yeah. So have I. So easy. <laughs> All right. Hi, Preston. Happy New Year's. <laughs> Happy New Year, Preston. Hey, this this is the last, uh, last show that we're going to do of the whole year. So yeah. Happy New Year. All right. Uh, brings over here. Astronomy Cast, episode 328, Telescope Making, part two. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, 
and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good, good. So this is the last show that we're recording for the 2013, which was a fantastic year in space and astronomy, and now we're on to 2014. Yeah, it's it's uh, that was perhaps the fastest year ever. It's it's one of those weird things when you're a kid, time never seems to pass, and when you're an adult, um, you take as many running leaps as you can, and the world still gets ahead of you. So, what was your favorite thing in 2013? We don't have, we don't want to do a long intro, but what's your the big thing you think? Oh. I think the most awesome thing I did was watch the sunrise with a fur seal in New Zealand, which was like the whole southern hemisphere thing, so that was all kinds of awesome. And my favorite science thing was uh, Mars Curiosity keeping uh, on with a whole series of, yes, I'm roving along a riverbed. Yes, here's more evidence I'm roving along a riverbed. Yes, this is a riverbed. Um, that was kind of awesome. For me, I got to tour SpaceX. I think that was the big highlight for me for the year. That was amazing. Um, and uh, and I think my uh, my favorite thing was Voyager. Actually, Voyager re leaving the solar system was uh, was pretty awesome. Or so, did it? Well, it left the heliosphere, so it's, <laughs> you know, it's into interstellar space. But obviously, clearly, it's still in the gravitational field of of the sun. But yeah, I think I thought it was great that we've fired a spacecraft that far out, it's still communicating, go Voyager. Go Voyager, I agree with that. All right, well, let's rock. So, some astronomers are control freaks. It's not enough to buy a telescope. They want to craft every part of the experience with their own hands. If you're ready and willing to get your hands dirty and covered in glass dust, you can join thousands of amateur telescope makers and build your own telescope from scratch. Now, this sounds like madness to me. So, why on Earth would a person build their own telescope? Uh, why would someone knit their own sweater? Why would someone build, build their own car? Why would someone build their own anything? It's, it's because, A, you, you, you want the experience of knowing how it's done. And because you want to make it yours. And there's just the bragging rights of, this one's mine, I made it from scratch. Um, there's also ergonomic issues some people get into. They have specialized photography they want to do. Um, one of the coolest things I saw that someone built was a pair of, I want to say, 12-inch telescopes turned into um, binocular. Oh, yeah. man. Oh, and that so would that be something. Was, and it was custom done so that you could adjust the separation on the eyes by rotating things and... It was just this really crazy off-axis design that made it work kind of like your eyeballs were at prime focus. So you're telling me that people may want to build their own telescope so that they can learn about the science and enjoyment of, of astronomy more, that they can customize their own telescope to exactly what they want so that they can just spend time building a thing carving it out of nothingness which has value on its own and uh, but I think one of the important reasons is is not to save money no do no, not build a telescope if you're hoping that that's going to be an inexpensive way to get and, a telescope and this is where I have to keep going back to the knitting analogy as I look I have knitting and glass apparently tangled in a mess on my desk um, if you look at how much it costs to buy the yarn to knit a sweater, you, you should just like go out and buy the most expensive hand-knit wool sweater from Ireland you can find, and it will be cheaper. Um, building and a better. tele, well, not necessarily. It depends on how good a knitter you are. Okay. Um, right. And the same is true with telescopes. It may or may not be better. Um, but when you're hand building it, it's it's completely bespoke. It's completely made to your design. Now that doesn't mean you're not going to screw something up, but since it is completely bespoke, every single thing has 
an individual cost. There's no bulk discount that gets passed down to the buyer. So you're you're crafting your own focusing mechanism or buying it. You're crafting your own tubes, you're crafting your own supports, you're buying the raw materials, and you have to factor in your own salary at a certain level. One of, one of the things that I had a colleague once point out to me was if it's going to cost you five hours to do a task and you could hire someone who's better than you to do it in three hours and it's going to cost them or cost you to pay them less than you would earn in three hours, pay them. You'll earn more money that way. And, and that's kind of a crazy thing to think about. But when you grind a mirror, you're looking at putting in potentially hundreds of hours into getting the surface exactly right. Redoing it, testing it, doing it some more, testing it, figuring out how to silver or aluminize it, shipping it back and forth, testing it some more, installing it. Yeah. And a good telescope is going to last you for years and years and years. Yeah, a lifetime if you do it right. So you, this is a one lifetime job. Now, of course, it's it's a total bottomless rabbit hole of hobby time, and you'll build, uh, you'll finish that one, and all you're going to do is want to think about the next one that you're going to want to build. But you know, Which this is, is not going to be something you want to regularly do. I think another really valuable thing is just you understand at a very deep level how the telescope works and so if you do get your own, you buy a telescope, you could modify it, customize it, extend it and and make it more of what you want. So so it's all there's always value in, in going through, down this road and, and building things with your own hands and, and understanding it. It's, it's and, always time well spent. And, and the, the really good point you're making here is you're not learning astronomy. You're not going to learn anything about Jupiter building your own telescope, but you're going to learn so much about optics, learn so much about how light works, how mirrors work, how lenses work. And so you're you're becoming an optical engineer instead of becoming an astronomer. And this is showing the other side that there is to how we understand our universe. Is it takes engineers on the computer side, on the hardware side, on the optical side, and the astronomers all working together. Yeah. So so then, all right, so we, a person has decided that they want to jump into this field of building their own telescope. Where do they start? What, you know, how do you begin this process? <laughs> well, luckily there's a, a ton of books and a ton of clubs out there just waiting to help you. If you happen to live in New England, that could perhaps be the absolute best environment for being an amateur telescope maker. And, and for those of you outside of the United States, New England is the strange regional name that we give to the part of America that is Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, Connecticut. Um, so outside of Boston, in my hometown of Westford, Massachusetts, uh, is the meeting house for the Boston Telescope Makers Association. Uh, they meet in Westford, Mass on the grounds of Haystack Observatory and this is a club of people who are constantly finding new ways to innovate building telescopes. There's the Stella Fane Club up in Vermont and these two organizations have both been around since before World War II and they're a great resource of humans. If you're out on the West Coast, um, then the um, Cabot Science Center has its own uh, amateur telescope making society. The Charles Hayden Planet, sorry, the Hayden Planetarium uh, in New York City has off and on throughout the years had astronomy uh, clubs that focus on making telescopes. In all of these organizations, you're going to find someone who probably has the gear to loan you to get you started and the expertise to teach you, so how do I start? And the first stage is always grinding your own mirror. And that's the hard part and the easy part in a lot of different ways. So then, and so this is obviously going to be a Newtonian telescope here that, that people are building. They're not building... They're not building um, refractors. They're going to build a, a reflector. So, so when you're getting started, you want to give yourself as few pieces to screw up. Um, it, it's sure you could go ahead and start by making a refracting telescope and grind all four surfaces of the lenses and curse yourself over and over and over again. Um, 
But if you start with a Newtonian telescope, the only surface you have to grind is the surface of the primary mirror. And the nice thing about grinding mirrors is if you screw it up and you start with a thick enough mirror blank, you just keep grinding until it's the right shape. You can't do that with a lens. So what does a mirror blank cost? Like if I want to buy a 4-inch, a 6-inch, 8-inch, do you know sort of roughly what a, what a mirror blank costs? I'm Googling. Sorry, Preston, looking this up. Uh, I, I can tell you what they're made of. I can answer lots no, of other... No, I know, other... I know, I know. I'm looking it up too. Sorry, Preston. <laughs> Every now and then I ask Pamela a question that she has no idea and wasn't I there for. I know nothing about the costs of things that aren't related to my websites. Because um, really, that's all I spend money on. Um, I'm seeing like four blanks. inch for 15, six inch for 25, yeah, eight inch for I'm, 35, 10 inch for... I think we're looking at for... the same site, telescope mirror blanks. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so wow. Okay, yeah, they're not that expensive. All right, so let's, let's take that a crack. So I just asked okay. you uh, how much do these things cost. It, it's actually not that expensive. All a mirror blank is is a round disc of glass that's fairly thick. And you can get a 14-inch one for around $80 when you factor in shipping. So there you are looking to build your 14-inch telescope, and the mirror is like 80 bucks. And that would be a $3,000 telescope, more. It would be about a $2,000 telescope yeah. if it has all of the gears and everything else. Um, if you're looking at a daub, you're looking at a $500 telescope if it has no motors. So it's... It's looking like it's going to save you money, so oh, now... it's a you... trap. <laughs> it's always a trap. It's always a trap. Um, so, so once you have your, your chunk of glass, you need a surface that you can adhere the mirror to so that it doesn't move while you're grinding it. This is usually some fairly generic flat surface and something either... It is tree, tree sap or something resembling tree sap in consistency that you can essentially glue your mirror non-permanently to that surface. Right, and get it back off again. Exactly. Then you have to buy a grounding grinding stone. So this is a surface that is um, more solid than that piece of glass is that you can use to grind away at the surface. You need grits of a variety of different thicknesses, just like you use sandpaper of a variety of different uh, coarsenesses when you're you're making furniture, and that's just to make your mirror. But how? I mean, I'm imagining. So you do this by hand? Yes. Okay. And and the kind of awesome thing is, the way nature works. If you just kind of randomly rub a rock across the surface of a piece of glass, it's going to naturally tend towards a spherical hole. Uh, this just has to be, this just has to do with the fact that all those random movements add up to you cross the center most often. You cross just out of the center a little bit less often and so on and so forth. It's just a probability function, essentially a Gaussian probability of where you're going to hit the surface with the rock as you randomly rubbed across the surface. But how do you know when to stop? <laughs> right? How do you know when um, you've done it right? So so you you grind on it and as you go you periodically stand it up and you use what's called a knife edge test to uh, reflect life, light off the surface and you know the curvature you're aiming for and it usually matches the curvature of the grinding stone that you're using um, and, and you use this knife edge test to look at the pattern made when you pass a pinhole of light across that knife edge onto the mirror. And if you get nice, perfectly even illumination, that means you have a nice, perfectly spherical mirror. Uh, if you don't, well, the way that you don't have a nice, evenly illuminated s surface reflects, quite literally, uh, all of the errors that you have in your mirror grinding. And so you can reflect this light, you can see the reflection, uh, the mistakes, and then you grind a little, polish a little more in an area, and those mistakes will start to go away, and the optics will start to come online and, and match what you're looking for. Exactly. And there, I think there's also, like, a you can put, like, a like a form into it, right? And you can kind of turn it and make sure that it's, you know, you've got there's, roughly the right spherical there, shape. There's forms you can use. Uh, 
it's it's one of those things where where every one of those old experts who's been doing this for a couple of decades has a whole laundry list of tricks of the trade that they can teach you that use everything from different types of diffraction gratings to lasers to pinholes to you name it um, and there's no one right way there are wrong ways but there are many different right ways to measure the surface of your mirror and so if you sit and just grind on this mirror how long do you think you'll be looking at it there it depends on what focal length you want so the longer your focal length so the the larger the number of your telescope um, that means that it's a segment of a bigger and a bigger and a bigger circle for a spherical mirror the focal length is one half the radius of the sphere that that mirror would be a, a segment off of so if you're imagining you have something with a 300 millimeter focal length well you don't have to grind too much to get that compared to something that is say a hundred millimeter focal length compared to a 50, 50 millimeters starting to be ludicrous but um, as you change these numbers you're changing how deep into the mirror you have to grind something with a very very long focal length you're going to need longer exposures you're going to have a smaller field of view but you don't have to grind as long uh, so it may be a matter of a few weeks to if you're doing something with a really short focal length, months and months and months and months. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I've I've taken this time. I've ground the mirror. I've done all my tests. It's it's perfect. <laughs> Polished it. It's smooth as silk. It's a beautiful piece of glass. I've only broken three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and have had to go back and now triple the price of the uh, of the the mirror blanks. But now right. I've got this nicely ground mirror. So what do I do with it? Well, uh, so now it's still not a mirror, actually. Right now you just have a big old chunk of glass that you've made right. nice and perfectly smooth. Uh, once you have that chunk of glass, the shape that you want it, you have to find someone probably with an aluminizing tank, and what they'll do is mount your mirror on one end of this vacuum chamber and escape all of the air out of the, the chamber and then use a coil to heat up and melt aluminum that will then, uh, thanks to a uh, charge that you put on the mirror, go flying through the chamber and adhere quite nicely and hopefully in a nice couple of atom thick uh, layer all across your piece of glass, making it into a mirror. Once you've aluminized it, you overcoat with something to protect that surface. You can also use silver, but the problem is, as anyone with like actual silver nose, silver oxidizes. It gets tarnished, it changes color. Um, so for a lot of purposes, just go ahead and use aluminum. Gold's nice too, isn't it? I don't know the spectral characteristics mm. of gold. Uh, in general, people make mirrors out of silver or aluminum. Yeah, but I know like with the James Webb, it's gold. Yeah, but it works in the infrared. Infrared, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so we're not viewing that from the surface of the Earth. No. Um, okay, great. So then I've got my mirror. So now I have my actual mirror back. Then that's that's the that really the hard work is done. Yeah, yeah. That that's that's the annoying part. So now you need a flat mirror to make your secondary. Uh, you need a tube or a set of uh, supports. Uh, so this this is the stage where you can go the. I'm just going to use a bunch of either carbon fiber tubes or PVC pipe is often used. Build a support for your mirror build the tube coming up, build a spider across the top to, um, well not across the exact top for a Newtonian inside where the top is uh, for where your secondary mirror is going to be, shoot that light out the side into an eyepiece, except now you're in the land of oh god I have to arrange all of this so all of the surfaces are perfectly aligned because if you don't, well you run into problems with uh, all sorts of different aberrations where your images can end up looking like comets instead of like stars and that's kind of annoying. And so if things aren't lined up perfectly, again back to lasers, back to shining light, line it all up, 
you're going to get chromatic aberration. You're going to get things are not chromatic. We're talking about mirrors. Okay, right. So you're going to get you're going to get uh, right. You're going to get blobs. You're going to get things are just not going to feel nice and crisp, and it, it'll never focus. And and you have to make sure all your distances are correct, because otherwise you'll never be able to get your telescope in focus. And that is uh, what my, one might call a very annoying problem. And that, I guess, is going to be tough, because I mean, you're going to drill a hole on the side of your carbon fiber tube, and then mount your focuser there. And if you got the measurements wrong, time to drill another hole, get a new tube. <laughs> Or and and one of the nice things is that some people will actually instead of using a solid tube that's the same diameter as your mirror, you just build a trussle out of multiple small diameter tubes. But you're still trying to figure out how to mount everything on the side, screw it in the right place, wrap all of that with a piece of canvas to act as a light block. Um, but yeah, it's kind of annoying when you don't get it right, and. Since you're folding the light, you have to take into consideration the thickness of the mirror that you're using as your secondary and all that sort of stuff as you go. Now, what about the mount? I mean, you're not going to want to try and build your own mount. Why not? Okay. Just build, build an Opsonian. Yes, yes, with plywood and... and Casters, and casters, and, and yeah, and and set the whole thing up. Sure, if you do want to Dobsonian, and I, I think one of the reasons that we didn't mention at the beginning of the show is one of the reasons to build your own telescope is so that you can have the biggest telescope, right? I mean, the if you're going to buy a 20 inch telescope, a 22 inch telescope, 24 inch telescope, you can't afford that easily. You can't afford that, no. But you can grind it, and you can build it, and it's going to be. 20 feet long, 12 feet long. It's going to be a gigantic <laughs> Dobsonian telescope. Have you looked through a 22-inch? One of the obsessions. I've, I've looked through a 30-inch Dobson. Oh, like a homemade 30-inch yeah. Dobson? Yeah. Yeah, right? So, and that's a colossal amount of light-gathering power, and you're not going to buy one off the shelf. Someone's going to have to sit down and... Well, you can. They're called the obsessions. There, there's a few companies that make 30-inch Dobbs, but you can make one for yourself. And these are these are actually works of art. They're beautifully stained. They're made out of beautiful pieces of wood in some cases. I've seen people that have made telescopes that they they make the best carpentry in a furniture store go to shame because they've lined up the grains just right, uh, different types of dye to bring out different colors. Um, stunning works of art and they move so smoothly so you're, you're worrying about it has to be able to to tilt and tip and you have to be able to rotate it about the base um, they're they're gorgeous there there was actually a project for a while called group 70 out in California which was a group of amateur astronomers who were trying to build um, the world's largest amateur telescope. Um, eventually they gave up, they ran into funding issues, but uh, it's it's been one of those things where people have realized you can go bigger than a mirror when you're making it yourself, cut the costs, and still build just a really solid instrument. Yeah. Now, so I think you, as you said, so you build a Dobsonian and that way you handle the mount, but if you do want, you know, if you do it right, you can bolt this onto a nicer mount, bolt it onto a pier, and and use it as a as a real, I guess. I mean, the, the nice thing about having a having a, a mount is that you're going to be able to track the sky. You're going to be able to do some, right. some astrophotography, some CCD. So if that's your goal, um, just and, buy a telescope. <laughs> but you know, there, if that's your goal. Mount it to a to a to a serious mount that will track the sky. And and there are people out there who have figured out how to build tracking systems for Dobsonians. It's Corey basically, Schmitz. Yeah, yeah. Has they're done they're it. basically it's clock gear systems. The technology's been around for well over a hundred years. Um, again, it's really hard to get everything right. And here you start having to worry about things like perfect balance, about slacking your gears, about being able to consistently move when the center of mass is straight up uh, versus when it's at a right angle to, to the system. Um, all of these things come into play. Telescopes flex. Um, that's really annoying when you're trying to point. All of this stuff adds up to more and more time in the machine shop. 
Now, we've talked about building a reflecting telescope. Is there any value at all in attempting to build a refractor? Or is that just a whole other level? Is that the super ninja skills, those people? Uh, it, that that falls into the cat care... Blech. Sorry, Preston. Loss of English. Um, that falls into the category of super ninja skills. There are people out there who have decided... I don't like any of the stuff available for sale, so I'm going to figure out how to design optics that do exactly what I want and then get them custom manufactured. That's where Al Nagler started. Is He was an optical engineer working in industry. He wanted the best dang eyepieces on the planet, and out of his desire to do something awesome, we now have Teleview telescopes, which I desperately want to own someone. Own right. I mean, one of them someday. Like looking through one of those is just like falling into space. Yeah, he has eyepieces that have like 180 degree fields of view in terms of how the, the image is spread across what your eye sees when you look into the, the eyepiece. And just the fact that it fills your peripheral vision is really magnificent. Yeah, and and so that's the same thing. I guess someone who knows their optics can say, I would like more field of view, please. Well, I can't buy it. <laughs> well, then I will make it. <clears throat> and, and yeah. And, and you also have people who are now custom making their cameras, which is really cool. Uh, people who want to be able to do more high-speed imaging, so they're figuring out how to set up systems that have the shutters working in different ways so that when you do the really short exposures, there isn't actually a radical difference between how long the center and the edge are exposed. You have people figuring out uh, how to build systems that you can mount at the prime focus. Uh, Gary Ganella is one of our Star Party folks who's figured out how to hack his telescope so his camera's up at the prime focus part of the telescope where it was never designed to be, but he gets so much wider of a field of view because of that. Yeah, and Mad, and so one person who also helps out with the virtual Star Party is Mike Phillips, and he has built his own telescope. Uh, it's Akule, I think it's Akule. I'm not sure how he, just, how he pronounces it. But uh, it's a 14-inch Newtonian telescope. It's just a classic example. And and it's and it's phenomenal for planetary work. So he's gone and said, I want to build a telescope that's going to be really good for planetary work. And you see some of the pictures that he's taken of, of Europa, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and you can see the colors and Mars and the Martian moons and stuff. So, so if you really know what you're looking for, you almost have to build your own telescope. Well, I, I'm not sure if it's so much nowadays it's a build it from scratch as a customize it. I think we're moving with telescope technology into the era we were at with cars in the 1960s where uh, back then you'd buy yourself a muscle car and fine tune it and change this and change that until it did exactly what you wanted as fast as you wanted as loud as you wanted. Well now people are buying telescopes so that they can get images as fast as they want, as detailed as they want with the field of view they want. You buy it, you customize it, you get what you want but you don't start from scratch. Do you think you would ever build a telescope? Um. I, I don't think my eyes are good enough to justify it. Um, I'm very much a, uh, let me write software to make the telescope do exactly what I want. That, that was something I did in grad school. I got fed up with having to by hand move the telescope in a specific pattern to uh, move it around the galaxy clusters I was imaging. So I just wrote software. Yeah, you're a coder. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, a hacker. I, I don't know if I would have the patience for it. I don't know. Probably not, but I sure appreciate when yeah. people have built their telescopes. So, so if you've built a telescope, send us an email. We'd love to see some pictures of the telescopes that you've that you've built. So there are some amazing designs out there. Yeah, and I would love to. You know, we run stories on University Today all the time about people who've who've done this. So I'm I'm a huge fan, but I don't think I'll ever do it myself. Um, cool. Well, thanks, Pamela. Next week we're going to talk about building your own space telescope, which is going to so, be super fun. a whole new level. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thanks, Pamela. We'll see you next Thank week. Thank you, Fraser. Bye-bye. next year. Yes, and next year. Happy New Year's. All right. Okay. Saving. Okay. 328. Yep. 
My dog came in midway through recording and lay down on the floor with her head in the bed and her body on the carpet. I saw you not sure whether you should eject that dog or <laughs> keep, keep your total pro. Keep recording. Never, never stop. Well, it, it was the one who was most likely to lay down once she realized I didn't have food. You just said the F word, though. She's still dead asleep. Oh, okay. All right. I don't know. Where is my remote control for my camera? All right. I am uploading. We are safe. So let me look through the questions. Did anything happen on the Twitters? Yes, actually, Daniel Yont, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to say his name, had a really great question. He said, I wonder if an open source 3D printer for making grinded mirrors, um, let alone parts. Um, so translating Twitter speak into English, um, what about 3D printing telescopes Ooh. in the future? And I think that's really the direction I'm, things are going to end up going. You can oh. 3D print a Galileo scope really easily. Well, so I was at, when I was at SpaceX, uh, they have a 3D titanium printer. And so they can print titanium in any shape you want. I did not know such magic existed already. With, with, with a grating. Like, and so they had a sort of a test they showed you. It looked like a block of titanium. But you could hold it up to the light and you could see that it was actually a grating of titanium. And Good so they Lord. had put microscopic holes all the way through. They had printed in microscopic holes all the way through it. So it blew my mind, right? Yeah, so 3D yeah. printing is is a whole new world. Now, I don't know if there's 3D glass printing because it's, you know, it's kind of gloopy, so I don't no, know. No, but transparent plastic, and if if you're doing a mirror, so the problem with 3D printing right now is most printers still leave this stripy texture on the surface, and so I'm thinking thinking that um, you'd still have to do a final polish, yeah, but it could but get, get the you right a good, shape. Yeah, it could get you most of the way there. Can you, somebody try it. Somebody print. Uh, Internet, I request, I call to you. 3D print a telescope mirror, polish it. I don't know, put some tinfoil in front of it. See if you can get it anodized, and uh, let's see if it works. Don't put tinfoil. Aluminum, aluminum foil. Yeah. Coating. No, no. Coating. Just to see not. if it works, Pamela. Like not, not the final telescope. We're just. This is a proof of, proof of concept. So if anyone's got a 3D printer out there, let's see a a, a tiny little mirror made from 3D printing. Thank you, Internet. Um, all right. Any other questions on Twitter? No. Not that I see. Okay. Um, Astronomy for Fun Outreach asks, uh, I've been asked to help a local school to build telescopes. They've got a budget of just 400 pounds, which is a, a, a trillion That's Canadian... That's pretty good. It's about a trillion Canadian dollars, I think. Uh, what no, would you suggest it's, it's the, like 600. Yeah. What would you suggest is the base way, best way to get the most scopes from such a small budget? Sounds like a bunch um, of Galileo scopes and then one nicer scope. Yeah, I'd, yeah that's exactly what I'd say, is uh, get... So, so for that price, you're not going to get one nicer scope. Um, what I do is there's two different strategies. I'd either get as many Galileo scopes as you can for that price, um, and then you basically have optics kits for all the kids to use, as well as telescopes, and you want to get those with photo tripods as well. Um, the other strategy is get yourself uh, one of the Dobsonian telescopes that has... Uh, a pointing system on it so it doesn't steer the telescope for you but you line it up on two stars or three stars depending on the system and then it will give you arrows to help you find things and it's actually a really good way to learn it's like mm -hmm. having someone stand over your shoulder yeah. so Orion makes one called the Intelescope system for their Dobsonians and and I've always been a strong fan of those. Astronomers Without Borders now has a Dobsonian available. I haven't used it yet, but I've heard good things about it. That's so I'd look. Celestron makes those, right? Yeah, Celestron makes those. So I, yeah. I'd look at the Astronomers Without Borders telescope and at Orion's Dobsonians. Nice. Yeah, I mean, you can get a nice 80-inch Dobsonian telescope for 400 pounds easy. Yeah. And, even, and that leaves you money to get... Galileo yeah. scopes and a couple of extra lenses. Yeah, and maybe a nice pair, you know, a pair of binoculars. 
yeah. another 50. So I think that's, that's a great way to go. I would go with the Dobsonian too, I agree. Um, uh, Lance INTJ says, thanks for the series. Do you know where I could go for a computerized mount with a tripod for an existing telescope? So, um, I mean, how anywhere? much you want to spend? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'd start by giving, depending on where you are in the world, giving the folks at Oceanside Fo and te Photo and Telescope a call. They do not give us any money. Um, they, they've done right by me several times in terms of saying, I have a telescope, it weighs this much, this is my goal, what should I buy? And they've talked me out of spending money I didn't need to spend. Yeah, I mean, the... The CG5 from Celestron is is a mount that a lot of people will go for. I mean, it all depends on the size of your telescope and then how much, you know, how much it's going to weigh. A mount can handle a certain amount of weight, and in yeah. generally, you want to not get to that limit because then, you know, the closer you get to that limit on the mount, the more it's going to, you know, it's going to get wobble and it's going to get kind of cranky. So, uh, it just depends on how much you want to spend. I mean, you can spend. I mean, as you have always recommended, Pamela, you want to spend almost more on the mount than you yeah. do. Telescope. So, so do don't not get wooden legs. Do not get wooden legs. I have encountered in the backs of university closets more telescopes with wooden legs than you can burn in a bonfire, and that's where they belong. Do not get wooden legs. Yeah. So don't be surprised if you're going to spend. I mean, if you want a, a good mount, you're going to spend more than a thousand bucks. Yeah. So, um, that's the that's the way to go. Um. Uh, Russell Bateman says, this guy grinds the best mirrors in Canada. NormanFulhamTelescope.com. So, there you go. Norman Fulham Telescopes. Canadians, talk to Norman. Uh, so, Mike Phillips says, oh, interesting. Okay, I was too scared to grind my own. I paid someone else to make Akule. <laughs> and Akule, this is Mike, yeah, Mike Phillips has its own Google Plus page. So you can actually go and see Akale's page and and talk to his telescope. But so that makes sense. So he paid someone else to grind that. I w Mike, if you can tell us how much did you spend to get somebody to grind it for you, I'd I'd love to know because yeah. I think a lot of people would be interested to know what that cost. So. Um. Let's see. Uh, Jamie Orlando says that Meridian Telescopes also sells blanks. Okay, and one thing that I for forgot to mention during the show, is there's actually a website, AmateurTelescopeMaker.com, that has link after link after link after link of resources to go get the equipment you need. Cool. Um, I think those are all the questions I've got there. Uh, we had a nice troll over on Google Plus being a jerk, and he got banned. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Michael Jobin says that Google Plus has committees, communities on telescope making. So that's a good point. There, you know, yeah. of course. So on Google Plus, there's going to be an amateur telescope making community. So if you're serious, and, and this, you know, with these kinds of things, if you have this vague interest that you want to join a new hobby like that, the best thing to do is just start to immerse yourself in the culture of it. Yeah. Join the community, people. join the discussion forums, and watch the conversations that people are having, and then just try to jump into the conversations as you start to understand a little better, and then you can start to take these, these leaps out beyond your comfort level but yeah I just th I just think that process is just so good uh, whether it's telescope making or whether it's woodworking or windsurfing or anything like we should all be constantly moving forward expanding our capabilities in this real sort of step-by-step -step process I mean look at what we've done with the cameras I mean you and I yeah both were like I want to get into DSLR I'm not really sure what to yeah. do we both bought the same camera what a year and a half ago, two years ago? Yeah, it was yeah a year and a half ago because we both took them to Mexico. We last took year. them to Mexico, right? So we've both had our cameras for about eighteen months, and and in that time, you've been t you've taken yours around the world, you've taken these amazing pictures. I've been I've, we've recorded seventy episodes of a video on our U on our YouTube channel. Yeah, we're just getting, and I I feel like we're really starting to understand and really see that these things are are amazing cameras to work with, and we're figuring out you know, the capabilities. It's great. And so just 
pick a hobby like this. If it's not building a telescope, something, something that stretches you, that gets you interacting with the world and other people, like-minded. Yeah. Don't sit home alone and, and read Facebook. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Get out there and build a telescope. But find the group on Facebook to join or on Google. Yeah, yeah, only read their group. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's weird. Different cultures exist in different social media. Telescope and astronomy, people all on Google+. My horse friends, all on Facebook. Yeah. Um, Ken Novi says, okay, could you now do a biggest, cheapest reflector show? Uh, Dobsonian? Dobsonian. Great big yeah. Dobsonian. Well, we mentioned that, right? You can get the The obsession the Dobbs are amazing. Yeah, but if you wanted to build your own, cheap cheapest was the key. Yeah. Then you're gonna have to grind your own. And PVC pipe if you want the cheapest. Yeah, twenty five inch telescope. Get rolling. Um. Yeah, Michael Jobin says building a telescope is a personal challenge. Good, awesome. <laughs> Everyone is hailing Akule. So, um, yeah, it's very cool. Oh, so Mike Phillips came back. It was about two thousand dollars to grind his his. I, it's a fourteen inch telescope. So just to grind okay. the mirror, to pay somebody to do it is about two grand. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I think I'm running out of comments here. Anyone else? Anyone else? Now's your chance. Not uh, seeing anything over on Twitter. Um. Uh. Yuka Lasko says, I disagree about those wooden tripods. I have a Burlbach Uni 18 wood tripod, and it's way better than the Celestron's original steel tripod. Bow snap. I'd, I'd say his is better maintained than the average one, because the majority of the ones I find really belong in a bonfire. <laughs> <laughs> Burn them all. Burn cool. them all. If you want something that if you ignore it in a closet and abuse it horribly will last, get an aluminum tripod. Right. Cool. Um, okay, good. Well, I think we're done. So thanks again, Pamela. Happy New Year. Happy New thanks Year. Thanks to too. all the viewers, the people who join us week after week. Happy New Year to all of you. I uh, really hope you sort of have been enjoying the shows over this year. We've been working really hard to, to get them on a regular schedule. Uh, apparently, you know, that's important. It works. <laughs> apparently that, and, that matters. So. And you know, if you're looking for something to marathon on New Year's Eve, everything that we do is over on YouTube at Astrosphere Vids. Nice. So you can uh, watch our insanity for... Lots and lots and lots of hours. Totally. Awesome. Okay, well, hey, thanks, thanks again, everybody, for watching. Thanks, Pamela, for bringing the brain. And we'll see you all next year. <laughs> see you later. Bye-bye.